I, I can't thank you enough for all this imaginative generosity. And of course, I thank um, Penny and the whole James Merrill house um, for this lovely hospitality. I thought I would say a few words about James Merrill and read one of his poems before I plunged into my own things. Um, and the one is that I didn't know, I hardly knew James Merrill. I knew him just a little and um, met him first when I was a teenager and some neighbor in Ledyard brought me over to introduce this awkward, uh, bookish teenage girl to the august poet uh, uh, on Water Street. And I remember sitting terrified in his <laughs> enchanting living room and he was being very august and, and um, a sage and that was that. Um, but uh, I was reading all of his books as they came out and I continued to as long as he was writing books and living, and they were extremely influential for me. Um, so it was a, a great astonishment and an honor, and like, um, uh, as I said to Willard earlier this afternoon, as if Zeus had, had, had reached down from the clouds and touched me when I won the Nation Poetry Discovery Award, and on that jury was James Merrill. Um, and so we went out to dinner afterwards, and I was sort of encouraged to call him Jimmy. And, um, and he was, ex as those of you who knew him know, extremely gracious and lovely and, and charming. But we, we, do, we weren't what I would call friends, and then I didn't see him again for years. I was, uh, by that time, or soon, a young, struggling wife and assistant professor up at in Boston University and with uh, um, small children and an insane teaching schedule. And, uh, and my father had just died in 1989, and I was heavily grieving and in a difficult marriage, and exhausted and depressed. And uh, then John Hollander organized a reading at Yale for Yale poets, those of us who had you know, gone to Yale at some point. So it, I was in no shape to drive from Boston to, to Yale, to New Haven or read or do anything. I could barely cook an egg for my children, let alone teach my classes, but I pulled myself together and I had been struggling with a poem um, for, uh, I, was, I see music, go, I heard music going off. Somebody's phone is going off, I think. Um, anyway, I was struggling to write a, a, a poem about grieving for my father. It was sort of based on uh, the Iliad and, um, and I had just finished it, and so I somehow drove fumblingly down from Boston to New Haven. Uh, there was a group of us reading. I tremblingly went up to the microphone and read this poem, and then I turned around and I drove all the way back to Boston. Didn't go out to dinner with anybody because I had to put children to bed or survive. Um, and the most astonishing thing happened the next day, which I think was a Saturday. The phone rang, and I had never spoken, I'd hardly, <laughs> certainly never been, had a phone conversation with Jimmy Merrill, and it was Jimmy Merrill on the phone saying, I just want to tell you that was a fabulous poem, and then he talked to me about that poem for about 10 minutes, and that was truly like Zeus reaching down from the clouds and patting me on the head and making me think, okay, maybe, maybe I'll survive. <laughs> maybe I'll even write some more poems. So, in a way, this is a way for me to say thank you, Jimmy, um, for saving me uh, then. And I'll, I'll read that poem later, but first I thought I would read one of, one of Merrill's poems, um, which I've brought. I love many of his poems, and this is one, this is quite a late poem. Um, it's called The School Play. Um, and, uh, yes. So it's from the, the, the volume Late Settings that was published in 1985. The School Play. Harry of Hereford, Lancaster, and Derby stands here for God, his country, and... And what? Stands here for God, his sovereign, and himself, growled Captain Fry, who had the play by heart. I was the first herald, a small part, I was small too, but an important one. What was not important to the self at nine or ten? Already I had crushes on Mowbray, Bushy, and the Duke of York. <laughs> Handsome Donald Neiman, now himself according to the bulletin, headmaster of his own school somewhere out west, awoke 
too many self-indulgent mouthings in the dummy mirror before smashing it for me to set my scuffed school cap at him. Another year, I'd play that part myself, or Puck, or Goneril, or Prospero. Later, in adolescence, it was thought clever to speak of having found oneself, with a smile and rueful headshake for those who haven't. People still do. Only the other day, a woman my age told me that her son hadn't found himself at 31. I heard in the mind's ear an amused hum of mothers and fathers from behind, beyond the curtain, and that flushed, far-reaching hour came back, months of rehearsal in the gymnasium had led to, when the skinny nobodies who'd memorized the verse and learned to speak it emerged in beards and hose, or gowns and rouge, vivid with character, having put themselves all unsuspecting into the master's hands. <laughs> so, yes, terrific poem, I think. And something we probably, in our own ways, know what it is to put oneself into the master's hands. And here's the poem, the poem of, of grief for my father, which was filtered through my translating just working through the Greek of Book 24 of the Iliad, and the poem that, that, that Merrill heard me read at, and in New Haven and that he called me up about. Um, it's from an early, early book. And you'll remember that toward the end of the Iliad, um, Achilles in, uh, is, is in insane grief for his beloved Patroclus, who has been killed by Hector. And so Achilles drags the, course, the corpse of Hector around and around and around the tomb of Patroclus. And it's, it's, it's a, a brilliant image of grieving, I think, of obsessive grieving when you can't get out of that circle. And I felt I couldn't get out of that circle, and I couldn't get out of the circle because I couldn't finish the poem. And one was when I figured out how to finish the poem that I got out of that circle. The twelfth day. It was the twelfth day. The hero will not take food. He refuses wine, sleep, women. How can the body not spoil? Dragged by chariot, gashed, smeared in mud and horse droppings, mutilate, mutilate, cries the hero's heart as he lashes the horses around and around the tomb. If he can just make his mark on this corpse whose beauty freshens with each lunge as though bathed in balm, even the gods in gentle feast are shocked. Is there no shame? The hero has no other life. He has taken to heart a body whose face vaulting through gravel and blood blends strangely with the features of that other one, the beloved. For this is love, rigor mortis in the mortal grip, and never to let go Achilles hordes and defiles the dead. So what if heaven and earth reverberate release? So what if Olympian messages shoot through cloud banks, sea chambers, ether? So what if everything echoes the Father? Let Go, let go. This is ancient poetry. It's supposed to repeat. The living mangle the dead after they mangle the living. It's formulaic. That's how we love. It's called compulsion. Poetry can't help itself. And no one has ever explained how light stabbed the hero how he saw in dawn salt mist his mother's face, she who was before words, she who would lose him, saw her but heard words, let him let go, saw her and let 
his fingers loosen from that suspended decay and quietly, too quietly, turned away. Um, I was quite obsessed with Greek at that time, and that verb, some of you may know, luo is the ancient Greek verb to let go, and the, the, the form and the, this repeated, uh, that section of the Iliad is lue, lue, it's to let him let go, it's the, it's the hortatory subjunctive, and for a while I had the really not good idea of calling this poem hortatory subjunctive, but <laughs> <laughs> luckily I just dropped that. <laughs> not gonna fly. <laughs> Um, okay, so I thought I would read um, a s selection of, um, oh goodness, did I forget? Yes, um, all right. Um, I, I didn't bring some of the poems I was planning to read, but that's okay. Um, you want, really, you want book? Uh, no, I have that book. It's the earlier book I've left behind, but that's okay. I will make up for it. Um, Willard mentioned this book, the, the biography of the French poet Max Jacob, who was, yes, the great friend of Apollinaire and Picasso and a uh, Jewish uh, convert to Catholicism and especially the mystical variety, as Willard said, and it did take me over 30 years to write this book. Uh, so I thought I would read a couple of my translations of Jacob's poems just to give you a feel for this wild modernist poet. He became famous in 19... He was born in 1876, but he became famous in 1917 with his little book of radical prose poems called Le Cornier de, The Dice Cup, that has influenced all sorts of people outside of France, too, including John Ashbery, who has translated a lot of The Dice Cup. And this, this is the radical 20th century, cool, hard-edged, abstract version of the, the Baudelairean or Mallarmean or prose poem. So um, I'll read you one of his little prose poems which is on page 266. Um, and it is not comforting. <laughs> it's simply called poem in the mode of the abstraction of that period. It was written probably around 1912, 1913. It's hailing on the sea. Night is falling. Light the bull lighthouse beacon. The old courtesan has died at the inn. Everyone's laughing in the house. It's hailing, and they're showing a film to the sailors in the schoolroom. The teacher has a fine face. Here I am in the country. Two men are watching the bull beam shining. Here you are, finally, the teacher says to me. Are you going to take notes during the film? The little bunch of assistant teachers can make room for you at the table. Notes? What notes should I take? On the subjects of the film? No. You'll compress the rhythms of the film and the falling hail and also the laughter of everyone present at the death of the old courtesan to get an idea of purgatory. And so this is a sort of Ars Poetica of, this is the very close, close friend of Picasso. He was Picasso's first French friend when Picasso first came to Paris in 1901 as a, practically a kid. And, um, and, and so Jacob was in Picasso's studio at, at Montmartre day after day while Picasso, along with Brock, was inventing cubism and inventing a kind of pictorial abstraction. And so Jacob was doing the same thing with poetry. So when the character in the, this little prose poem says, what notes should I take on the subjects of the film? The answer is no. You compress the rhythms of the film. Um, but he also, Jacob, wrote um, lyrical poems in a marvelously complex uh, kind of French which took up traditional French cadences, the, the Alexandra in 12 syllable line or the eight or the 10 syllable line in rhymes and has twisted them all a little bit. And I think the way to think about it is to think about Stravinsky is to take a great classical tradition and just twist it and make it a little dissonant and off, um, which is what Jacob did to lyric poetry in French. And so here's one. Let's see, this one is on page 421. Um, he, he, was, he was homosexual and passionately, would fall passionately in love with men, and then as, a, as an ardent Catholic convert, become passionately guilty and agonized about it, and I think some of his best poems come out of that struggle. Um, and here's one of them, Agonies and More. And I, in translating it, I tried to give you an illusion of the cadences in French and of the rhyming. So it's, you know, translation is a magic act. It's, it's all illusion, the way magic is. You just 
you know, you're, you're making tricks, um, but you hope you're making good tricks. Agonies and more. I'm afraid you'll take offense as I weigh and weigh again in my works and in my heart, your love from which I live apart, that other love I'm dying in. What will these lines be about? God, whom you nag day in, day out? God, his angels and his priests? Or your love's infernal feasts and their gobbling agonies? Righteous rocks, old blood-soaked gods, I leave, return, veer close again to my all-too-easy sin. My loves are in my pocket here. I'll sail weeping out to sea on Edinburgh's city wall. So much sorrow marries so much love. This evening, poetry, your horse wears a black veil. So that's Max, and he took over my life for decades. <laughs> um, and uh, now I, th I, will, uh, I, ha I will not read some of the earlier poems I thought I would read, but I'll read some poems from So Forth and then some the new poems I've been writing in the last two years. Um, so let's see what I can read to you here. Um, here's a um, uh, cotillion photo. These young women will last forever posed like greyhounds, trapped in the silver crust of the frame. You can't tell one from another, the breed is so pure. They will never run. Each one aloft on a frozen wave of white cotillion lace, to resemble marriage, to resemble fate. I remember July sun pouring down in a prickly meadow and a garter snake skin laid out like fairy lingerie on a stone wall. This was Connecticut. There would be a stone wall. <laughs> Crickets were scraping marrow from the day. I was young. I'd been alone for weeks. I painted the meadow morning and afternoon, trying to capture the crackling sound with my brush. I was reading Oedipus Rex. I understood neither the snakeskin nor the play. Mm. Your life is one long night, said Oedipus to the prophet. Oedipus, who saw nothing. Oak trees rustled in drought. In saffron grass, small creatures skittered. There came a day when I said to myself, I should prefer to sleep. Small planets tasted dry and bitter on my tongue. And two days later, I woke, alone in the creaking barn at dusk, not knowing what day, what month, what year, but feeling the hall of earth rolling on its way. It is not your fate that I should be your ruin, the prophet said. I moved my arms, my legs, I unclenched my hands, and stood up, dizzy, on the cot. What was to come, would come, in its own good time, outside the frame. The moon was rising above the hill, a shy wind gathered force, and trees in their black silhouettes linked arms. Checking time as so. well. Um, a lot of these poems concern the problem of thinking about the pain of other people and how how not to feel it or how to feel it. Shelf. A human skull among the bibolo, dust to dust, it all evens out on the shelf under a veil of gray. There was a think in that cavity once, 
I have forgotten whole years of my life in those eye sockets once surprise and fear. You picked it up in a field in Turkey, a small head, a child, a youth. Who knows how he, she died, though we can imagine, yes, horribly imagine, and so forget. Better look at the Kenyan statuette of the woman carrying a pot on her head, or the soapstone dove from Japan, or twisted driftwood. Why go looking for sorrow? Yet we look, we hunt. You probe the boiled mackerel head for every mite of sustenance, brain, the tiny white golf balls of eyes, the fatty ribbon along the jaw, an augury in each bite. I don't want to remember how much pain I've caused. Centuries of war we store in our craniums, but in that skull now crouched on the shelf, no echo, no prayer, only air, a relic of air. Um, and in, the, in this book, there's a sequence of poems I call stealing the title from Chaucer, Legend of Good Women, though it doesn't have much to do with Chaucer. <laughs> they're all about remarkable women artists of some sort. So um, I'll read two of these, I think. Um, one of them is the pretty remarkably horrendous a person, uh, Coco Chanel, who is also a fantastic artist, I think, great, great clothing designer, and um, possibly a moral monster if you've read anything about her life. Anyway, um, here she is. At least here's my version of her. It has an epigraph from Chanel. Chanel, a garment should be logical, Coco Chanel. Yes. I made the perfume, yes, I am an orphan, light my cigarette, just so. The perfect profile, intaliode in air, now let the hems down, now we slash the collar, and when a man enters, always make him pay, always a stray prince around. Where am I? A spray prints around before the casino closes. This century tilts. I'm good at sphinxing. Elegance excludes. I exclude milk, waste, tears, uterus. Do I remember the large colored orphanage halls? No. I refuse. Place a Coromandel screen in front of the car wreck and your world war, my demi monde. We live in an age with no interiors, and his blood scrawled the pavement by the crumpled car. Embellishment gives way to line and ease of motion, a Bugatti flair, wealth assuming the proportions of catastrophe. And if the other was a German officer, I'm on my knees with a corona of pins bristling from my lips. It's not adoration, it's revenge. Um, and here's another one of my, my uh, good women. Uh, <laughs> this one has an, is the pop singer Marianne Faithful. Um, who, who fascinates me as a singer. She started this sweet little girl voice, um, you know, hanging out with the Rolling Stones, and, uh, and then had a period of tremendous self-destructive drug taking and even living on the street, and when she got herself out of that and started singing again, her voice was, you might say, wrecked, but actually became a really, to my point of view, a really expressive, interesting instrument. A way. The whole trick of this thing is to get out of your own light, Marianne Faithful. She said she sang very close to the mic 
to change the space. And I change the space by striding down the boulevard Raspai at dusk in tight jeans until an Algerian engineer plucked the pen from my back pocket. As if you're inside my head and you're hearing the song from in there. He came from the desert. I came from green suburbs. We understood nothing of each other over glasses of metallic red wine. I was playing girl. He played man. Several plots were afoot, all misfiring. One had to do with my skimpy black shirt and light hair, his broad shoulders and hunger after months on an oil rig. Another was untranslatable. Apollinaire burned his fingers on June's smoldering lyre, but I had lost my pen. The engineer read only construction manuals. His room was dim and narrow, and no, the story didn't slide that way, though there are many ways to throw oneself away. One singer did it by living by a broken wall until she shredded her voice, but still she offered each song, she said, like an Appalachian artifact, like trash along the riverbank, chafing at the key, plastic bottles, a torn shirt, fractured dolls, through which the current chortles an intimate tune. I'll read one more from this and then some new ones. I got really fascinated by the pre-Socratic Greek philosophers the last few years. I had read Heraclitus when I was a teenager, as a lot of us did in that generation, but not, um, not some of the others. So here, let's see, I'm looking for them. Um, Finding my way around my own book. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, here's from um, Anaximander. That the earth is suspended. As Scylla prinks purple from half thawed clods, and the cardinal flings his ribbon of song in two high arcs, then trails the vibrato among the boughs, May unclenches but not enough. Buds grip fetal leaves. Each night scatters frost. On sidewalks we tread on broken sky. You are sick and far away. The world is in flux, said Anaximander. Worlds are born, appear, and disappear. We perish, even the gods fade. Spare me the industrial daffodils poking through scraps of snow. The season will have its hard birth, and we will be dragged into light. For how many years has that ill corroded your gut? Whirlwinds, typhoons break out of the cloud. The tearing makes thunder, the crack against black makes the flash. So natural philosophy began. You watched glaciers slide and crash at the tip of the earth. You floated on a rope into ice crevasses to catch the gleam and the groan. Ice sculpted the planet and sculpts it still. You hammered aluminum into that shape. The stars are a wheel of fire, broken off from earth fire, surrounded by air. We came from the unlimited. To it, we return. So taught Anaximander of Miletus, who thought we would be destroyed. This is a really cheerful book. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll just read, I'll read a few of the, the even more cheerful poems that I read when um, my beloved and I were took refuge the first year and a half of COVID um, in his cabin in the Catskill Mountains. Um, 
And I was more scared of the politics than I was um, of the disease, but the disease was scary enough. I started reading Thucydides just to try to understand what was happening with the world seemed to be falling apart. It was falling apart before the election in 2020, I thought, but then after the election, it began really falling apart. Anyway, they set about wasting the land. When the plague first broke out among the Athenians, when the plague out of Ethiopia spread into Egypt and Libya and among the Persians, violent fever, bloody throats and tongues, vomit, blisters, foul breath, genitals, fingers, toes broke off when the plague we saw the moon rise. It floated over heaped, unburied corpses. Birds and dogs that ate them died. The moon rose over broken laws of God and man, smashed oracles, frantic mortal orgies. We saw, we heard words turned inside out, families broke, parties passionate for power crashed, no words were binding, no oaths reconciled. When the plague broke us, we broke each other. There's this other little poem that reflects that landscape. Boletus. Crickets are stitching the afternoon together. What the squalling catbird rends, crickets relentlessly repair. The maple shivers, sends yellowed messages sailing down. Too much has ripped. Half the main branch cracked off and hangs, teetering across the lower boughs, leaving on the trunk, a blonde wound. We cross the brook on stepping stones and climb west up the mountain flank through laurel thickets, along the scooped out valley of beaches, up the stream bed to sit on a fallen tree. But there's no rest. We carry with us what we left below, a country clawing its very idea to shreds. The scarlet boletus mushroom prongs from decaying wood. In its bishop's amaranth skull cap, it stands its ground. One kind will nourish, the other sickens, but not like the white amanita bringing on liver failure, seizures, death. And there are a lot of creatures that live with us up in the, in the mountains, and it's, it's a small cabin, and some of them are snakes, and I'm really scared of snakes. <laughs> there are some snakes in our life, and um, anyway, here's a, a, a poem that was really quite horrendous for me because this snake died, and anyway, you'll, you'll hear. I didn't want, I don't want snakes to die. I just don't want to meet them personally. <laughs> Small dead snake. As when I approached what I feared and didn't want to see, the small rat snake curled where it died, struggling in the glue trap set for mice. And I cried out and twisted my hands but returned to take up the trap with gloved fingers, tipped it into a plastic bag and carried it into the woods on a shovel and dug a hole in dense root-woven earth, buried it, then looked up where tall, leafy branches of beech and oak carded strands of cloud. So I tried to ease with both hands gently out of my chest 
my fears for you, my stories about what I feared for you, and tried to lift the stories free, to place them out of sight, beyond the grasp of my belief, beyond horror, but not beyond knowing what traps I had set for you, for me. Um, let's see, I'll just read a few more and then release us. This title comes from the Rolling Stones. The Rolling Stones seem to be really in my head tonight. Um, <laughs> I grew up in the 60s with dead flowers. If you hurt yourself before someone else hurts you, is that homeopathic? Watch me prick poison into my skin, sign my name in pain. Watch me miss the appointment, cancel the call. Watch me gulp smoke and receive a certificate of enlightenment between the smeared egg yolk horizon to the west and the bone white eastern sky. The emperor appoints me to the poetry bureau and I declare myself queen of the underground. On the back road, the turkey vulture plucked the guts from the squashed squirrel, then flapped up to the dead branch of the shagbark hickory to examine us examining the carcass. O oh, sacerdotal bird, with your crimson scalp and glossy vestments, teach us to translate the spasm, the cry, the disintegrating flesh, the regret. What can be made of all this grief over the butter yellow, humming, feather grassed, midday meadow, skim the shadows of vultures, ghostly, six foot wingspan, the swiftest signature, turning death into speed. And I will conclude with another snake, this one happier. Mm -hmm. I don't mind saying that this is also a, um, a love poem to my beloved, who's a mathematician. Number theory. The four and a half foot black-backed rat snake swayed up and across the kitchen screen door, seeking a way in, encountering instead our eyes. It slowly, deliberately withdrew to slide along the stone porch, over the wall and along the foundation, inspecting every crevice, feeling, nosing, listening its way toward a solution, which it found around the corner, up the back flagstone steps, where it squeezed its impossible length and girth, inch by patterned inch, into the crack beneath the topmost slate. So, we know we're living with a patient companion like you, inquisitive. You sit taut in your chair, whispering as you probe the gaps between prime numbers until infinity. Its pattern you seek, the opening through which your thought will glide suddenly into a lit space and be at home in a shaky house where wasps gnaw the walls. Thank you.